Dear students, uh, good morning to all of you. You are most welcome. Organic farming, a brief history. So as you know, this, this course has, uh, I think, two lecture and one, one practical. So I'll try to take five, six lectures and give you some idea about practicals also on organic farming. So history is very, very important so that we can understand the weaknesses of chemical farming or conventional farming and what are the advantages, why people shifted for or want to shift from conventional farming to organic farming. There must be some shortcomings. There must be some problems with the existing practices in chemical farming. That is why people started thinking about organic farming. So we need to have some brief idea about the history of organic farming. So basically, before the industrial revolution in Europe, or you can say developed countries, it was totally organic farming in the world. Similarly, in India, if you take case of India, in India, before 1960s, or you can say before green revolution came to India, all kind of farming in India was conventional farming. So these advanced countries started chemical farming much, much early than Indian farming. So you can see the first or post first industrial revolution period in West development. So this period was actually from 1760 to 1840. So during this period, all modern tools, machines, chemicals, pesticides were developed during this period, 1760 to 1840. During almost the same period, people started using these uh, chemical methods of farming. And even after 1840, they continued it. Coming to India, in India, the Green Revolution came in 1960s. Before that, we were using all kind of organic systems. It was totally organic system in India. So what were the technical, technological developments during industrial revolution? Like advances in textile, machines were developed, steam power, steam engine, iron making, invention of machines, glass making, gas lighting, cement making, etc. Then in agriculture also, these are technologies also found their place, like machines, use of machines is started, or tillage machines particularly. Harvesting, spraying, transport in bees, chemicals, pesticides, and fertilizers were introduced during the Industrial Revolution period and after that. So Jethro Tull, you know, for hoeing, you know, invented a horse drawn hoe and a seed mill with tines to sow the row crops, means Village operations started from here. By middle of the 19th century, SSP was manufactured. So who made first time this single superphosphate? Anybody knows? Lois. Lois. J.B. Uh, Lewis, I think, the L.A.W.S. James Lewis. So what he did, he was basically a businessman. And he wanted some money. He wanted to establish some factories and... and uh, industries and he, he just uh, took some bonds and used sulfuric acid to produce single superphosphate. And then he teamed up with uh, Gilbert and started long-term experiment in UK in 1843, I think, 1843. So he wanted to show to the people that the single superphosphate of fertilizer, new fertilizer is effective again, effective in improving the growth of the crops so that people can feel it is a new fertilizer, new thing, and people could buy it. So that was his basic purpose. Then first reactor, internal combustion engine in USA in 1910. You know these steam engines, they are external combustion engines, and diesel or petrol engines are internal combustion uh, engines. Haber and Bosch, 1910, ammonia synthesis, you are aware of it. And then nitrogenous fertilizer were made. DDT came in 1939 by Muller in Switzerland. Discovery of BSC in France. 
and nitrophenols were the first group of selective herbicides developed in 1933 and were followed by the development of 2,4-D and MCA in 1940s. So here you can see even post-green revolution, certain chemicals, certain machines or modern tools were developed or were invented that also, uh, that also helped in getting uh, chemical farm. They helped in the chemical farming or modern farm or expansion of modern farm. During 80, 1840, you know about contribution of Justice Von Liebig. He gave theory of mineral plant nutrition. He believed uh, mineral salts were the only nutrients plants needed and they could completely replace manure. And you know, he propounded the law of minimum also. So his contributions were there in plant nutrition. So he also talked about balanced nutrition. He talked about nitrogen, phosphorus ap application to the crops. And then F.H. King in, from USA, he visited uh, three countries, namely China, Korea, and Japan. And he wrote a book, Farmers of the 40 Centuries, uh, or its name is uh, Or Permanent Agriculture in China, Korea, and Japan. So he made several observations on the cultivation of crops in China, Korea, and Japan. And it is farmers of 14th century is, is also called as a travelogue. When one writes document, when he or she is traveling and sharing his experience in the form of a book, that is travelogue. So he proposed or he suggested that the farming in these countries was sustainable because uh, they were not using chemicals, pesticides, and they were very close to nature. And then Rudolf Steiner, you might be knowing about the biodynamic agriculture concept given by him. And he gave uh, eight lectures that were compiled by his disciples. And he is founder of an an anthroposophy, anthroposophy and father of biodynamic agriculture. So what is anthroposophy? See the bottom lines. Anthropo means human, Sophia means wisdom. So he defined it as scientific exploration of the spiritual world. In 1928, he meter the organization form around Steiner's teaching. So his disciples made the organization named Demeter, creating the set of standards to define sustainable agriculture practices. So this Demeter is actually kind of uh, assembly of uh, your standards means uh, what practices should be followed to sustain agriculture. Biodynamic agriculture, what is biodynamic agriculture? It is a form of alternative agriculture, which is close to organic farming, but it is based on pseudo-scientific and esoteric concepts of Rudolf Steiner. So all these concepts were not having scientific basis. Therefore, it is pseudo-scientific, called as pseudo-scientific and historic, esoteric concepts. Esoteric means very un unusual and understood or liked by only a small bunch of people. Not, they do not ap appeal to the general public. Only the disciples of people who are blindly following a certain thing. 1924, first of the organic agriculture movement started. Uh, treats soil fertility, plant growth, and livestock care as ecologically interrelated. This is important principle of biodynamic agriculture. Tasks emphasizing spiritual and mystical perspectives are there, which are really not liked by uh, general public at large. It emphasizes the use of manures and compost and excludes the use of synthetic fertilizer. Therefore, it, is, it has certain principles of organic farming. Pesticides and herbicides are also avoided. Emphasis from its beginning on local production and distribution systems, its use of traditional and development of new local reefs and varieties. Some methods use an astrological sowing and planting calendar. This is somewhat uh, unrealistic. Uses herbal and mineral additives for compost additives and field space 
such as burying ground cord quartz stuffed into the horn of a cow. Means you just ground the quartz and put it into the horn of a cow, which are said to harvest cosmic forces in the soil. Put this horn in the field and it will help to increase the yield of the crop. Biodynamic agriculture is a pseudoscience as it lacks scientific evidence for its efficacy. Now, next was 1939. It was Lord Northam Bourne. He is from USA. He was from USA. And he first time used the term organic farming. And his book was Look to the Land. These are very standard books in the field of organic farming. Look to the land. The, his theory was that the farm itself must have a biological completeness. Means everything has to be there on the farm. All inputs have to be there on the farm. It must be a living entity. It must be a unit which has within itself a balanced organic life. So here you can see he is mainly known for using the organic farming word first time. Now, Lady Eve Balfour from United Kingdom, she wrote a book, The Living Soil, in 1943. And she was responsible for spreading the organic philosophy globally. Her book inspired founding of the Soil Association in Britain in 1946. She said that there is close relationship between soil fertility and human health and decline in humans and fertility result in decline in humus health. She also conducted some field experiments uh, in which she compared mineral fertilizer with organic sources of nutrients. And she said that organic sources of nutrients give better quality than mineral fertilizers. So many people have worked on the, this subject. She's not alone. The 1947 doctors and consumers blame agricultural chemicals for causing the development of cancer and mental disorder. So this was another problem. It went, it went in favor of organic farming. Then J.I. Rodale from USA. Basically, he was a publisher who used to have a press which was known as Rodale, Rodale Press. He used to publish dictionary, dictionaries and some other books. And uh, But he developed some interest in organic farming. Uh, and he started a magazine, Organic Farming and Gardening. 1942, and uh, this uh, Albert Howard wrote many articles in his magazine in this organic farm. He contributed several articles to this magazine. So they have close working relationship, this uh, Rodel and uh, Howard. Uh, he was author or publisher, and he demonstrated organic farming and gardening techniques on his research farm and then published in his own magazine. He was founder of Rodel Press, and he popularized the concept of organic farming in his country, USA. And he also wrote a book, The Healthy Hunjas, 1948, and published by Rodel Press. In 1947, Rodel established the Soil and Health Foundation, which is now called as the Rodel Institute. So in USA, it was in 1947, he established a, a, an insti a institute named Soil and Health Foundation, which was renamed after some time as the Rodale Institute. It is a famous institute in USA, which is, uh, um, which is promoting organic farming, conducting research also on different aspects of organic farming. Anybody interested can go to the website of Rodale Institute and you will find a lot of information from USA on organic farming. Because USA in the world is the biggest market for organic products. Now we talk about a, uh, about Mesan, Mesanobu Fukuoka, Fukuoka in Japan. So he was proponent of natural farming, Japanese farmer and philosopher. And he was also having fair idea about microbiology. So the One Straw Revolution, it is a book written by him in Japanese. He always wrote in Japanese and some of his work were translated in, into English. So the One Straw Revolution was an introduction to the natural farming. It was really, uh, 
published in Japanese in 1975 and translated into English in 1978. The, the other book written by him was The Natural Way of Farming, The Theory and Practice of Green Philosophy. And, and uh, no, he was proponent of no till, no herbicide grain production techniques called as natural farming or do nothing farming. So he, he gave very interesting uh, knowledge in his book, The One Store Revolution. Most of the time he propagated natural way of farming or natural farming. He was saying that do not cultivate the soil, do not go for the tillage, just harvest, harvest the things from the soil and then you can just broadcast some seed and do not go for watering it, do not do anything in this case and do not control the weeds also. Allow biodiversity to, to prosper. So it was quite interesting and worth testing also. One need to go into the details how many people have adopted his farming, but I, I, I think it was not accepted and not uh, implemented by people, not adopted by people. However, some principles were important. Principles like he said that keep some kind of mulch, mulch on the soil, you do not take out, just harvest the fruit, so just take the grain from the fields or from the soil, do not take the straw, leave the straw there. So that is for why he called it one straw revolution. So it was typically natural farming, and now we can compare it with the modern natural farming of um, Subhas Palekar, Subhas Palekar natural farming or zero budget natural farming, or now it is simply natural farming. Sometimes its name was low budget natural farming. So it has uh, transformed into several names and now it is natural farming in India. If you compare the Subhas Palekar natural farming or natural farming of India promoted by Dev Rath, who is governor of Gujarat. So that natural farming is practically not natural farm. You are doing all artificial, you are using all artificial means. You are doing it artificially under agroecological condition or in agroecology. So that is genuinely not natural farming. But what this Fukuoka suggested was a form of natural farming. Of course, um, people doubt that how much successful it was, but it definitely conserved the soil, it conserved the biodiversity, so it had some advantages. Because that time he may not be thinking about the population. Uh, there At that time there may be less population in his country or in the world, but now you have very big population, so you cannot go that way, that way of natural farming to, to supply enough food to the people. Now, Rachel Carson from USA, she was marine biologist, marine bi biologist, and she wrote a book, Silent Spring, in 1962. She opened the world's eyes to the damage caused by pesticide, and she blamed that the industries of chemicals for spreading the incomplete information and government people accepting dictates of the industry. So she was saying that this industry industrialization is leading to the problem and these industries have lobby and they are able to convince the government uh, to allow their industries which are not good for human health. Now, Hans Muller and Mary Muller, they were husband and wife from Switzerland. They were proponent of organic biological agriculture. So another name Sometimes you will hear like biodynamic agriculture. You will also hear organic biological agriculture. So they worked through 1950s. They worked closely with Hans Peter Rusch, who was also a proponent of organic farming. They developed a natural and sustainable approach to farming, which they named as organic biological agriculture. So Hans Peter Rusch, he inspired his uh, Hans Muller and Mary Muller. So he wrote two books in German language, uh, one published in 1955, other is 1968. He gave the concept of nature as a cycle of living particles. 
build the theoretical background of organic biological agriculture. So these three people propose organic biological agriculture. You need not to get or have knowledge of every kind of agriculture because there are number of variants, number of versions of organic farming. Even in India, you will find that some people are saying yogic agriculture, some are natural farming, some are saying um, Vedic agriculture, Tau agriculture, Agnihotra. Uh, so many names are there in India. So many variants are there. Everybody wants to have his or her own religion, own name. So that is why you have so many versions. Similarly, at world level also, people have had different ideas about organic farming. Now, IFOM, International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements, it was established initially in France in 1972, but later on it was shifted to Germany. Now its headquarter is in Bonn. So if I ask a question uh, where the IFOM was established first time, so it was in Versailles, Versailles, France. But if I ask where are the headquarters of the I form located, so you can answer born Germany. So it is basically a kind of international NGO. Uh, governments are indirectly supporting this I form, and it provides authoritative information about organic agriculture, promote worldwide and exchange knowledge. So I form is also playing good role in spread of organic farming in the world. Basically, they have got some hidden agenda, and hidden agenda of I form is marketing or kind of business. So whatever you see in the market, the things, the promotions people do. So behind the scene, you will find their purpose is to earn money. This is to, to have some business or sale. And Meadows et al, it is Club of Rome, Italy, now in Switzerland. It was Club of Rome, published the book, The Limits of Growth, 1972. Issue of growth of human population and global economy. So this is important, means they were concerned about the human health also. So they asked questions, what will happen if the growth in the world's population continues unchecked? What will be the environmental consequences if economic growth continues at the current pace? So there is some questions which, which were important to abandon the conventional farming or chemical farming. Next is F. E. F. Shoemaker. Shoemaker is from Germany. He authored the book, Small is Beautiful, a study of economics as if people mattered. So he, he was basically against the industrialization, too much of economic growth. He said better to go for, uh, prefer the human health. Human health is more important than the economic growth. And you can see in the book, he, um, he has put picture of Mahatma Gandhi also in his book, cover page, 1973. Now, 1970s, know your farmer, know your food, worldwide, USA, Canada, Australia, Europe. Now, with the time, with all these, uh, these kind of information or books or uh, kind of uh, knowledge people gained about the problems created by conventional farming, particularly with respect to environment or with respect to human health. There may have been some increased diseases like cancer. And many people blamed this economic growth through industries. So now consumer got active in 1970s and they asked, uh, they encouraged the consumption of locally grown food. Locally grown food means if the, if the food is grown my, in my vicinity, I can have a look on this, how they are producing, what chemicals they are using. So I can have first-hand experience if I consume locally grown food. So there is the promotion of this concept with slogans such as, know your farmer, know your food. Then 1980s group of pressure for government regulation of organic production. Now people put some pressure on the governments, regulate this organic production, put some, uh, some legal things on this production so that consumers can be benefited. They can consume genuinely organic products. So throughout the world, various farming and consumer groups seriously began to pressure the governments uh, to regulate the organic production. 
This led to legislation and certification standards being enacted through the 1980s and to date. Currently, most aspects of organic food production are government regulated in major countries. <clears throat> Then in 1990s, retail market for organic farming is growing. Slowly means uh, standards were developed, they started developing and people started consuming organic food. So what were the drivers in 1990s? Quality and safety of food and the potential for environmental damage from conventional agriculture. So these were the drivers, especially in Europe and America. Uh, due to which people started consuming and demanding organic product. Though may not be in big, big demand, but, but initial was created for organic products. 91, 1991, European Union provided a legal framework for organic products. In 2002, United States adopts the National Organic Program. In USA, they call it NOP, National Organic Pro Program. The United States of America adopted the National Organic Program, provided a development framework for organic agriculture. Now, this was in brief about the world history of organic agriculture. And those who are interested, one book is also available on world history of organic agriculture on the same title, uh, written, I, I just forgot the name, but one book is uh, there, which is detailing the History of Organic Agriculture in the World. Anybody in this interested can ask me to get this book. So now we come to India, History of Organic Agriculture. It is largely influenced by Albert Howard. So he worked in India uh, at uh, beginning at in Imperial Agricultural Research Institute, IARI, in Bihar, Sam Samastipur, Bihar or you call that Pusa, Pusa Bihar. So he was basically sent to breed wheat varieties in India. He was basically a plant breeder, you can say plant breeder or botanist, who was interested to develop some rust resistant variety or variety resistance uh, tolerant to some biotic stresses. He did his work there, but during the same period, he was influenced by Indian farming system. Because by that time, Europe and America, it was all chemical farming. As I, as I told you, after, green, after industrial revolution, most of the farming in Europe and developed country became chemical farming. So he has already realized the problems associated with chemical farming. Particularly health of the soil was affected by using chemicals. Too much of tillage was undesirable. And the, the fertilizers or chemical fertilizers that were being used were not good, uh, not as good as your manures. So he developed some interest in Indian farming. He realized that Indian farmers were following crop rotations. They were growing legumes. They were not using heavy machineries. And they were, of course, keeping animals on their farm. And those animals were supplying manures. So he was inspired basically by our farmers or Indian farmers. And one time he declared Indian farmers as their own teacher. So he actually observed what was happening in India and he has taken most of the things from Indian farmers and he also put his things, his things, his, his, he was basically a scientist. So he scientifically analyzed those things and the major contribution of Albert Howard is in promotion of organic farming in India, particularly through uh, composting. He professed or he suggested use of compost or he gave, gave a lot of emphasis on humus. And uh, also diversification, diversification was important for him. And he described, he described the role of mycorrhiza uh, in his experiments. He conducted some experiment on citrus plants. And in citrus plant, he said that these microbes or mycorrhiza help in the uptake of nutrients from the menus. So this uh, mycorrhiza is not very new. Uh, many people have done work uh, much before. We are thinking they are new things, but the, the work is started long back on mycorrhiza. So he actually also wrote some books, some research papers, and number of articles in magazines, scientific journals, 
So he's also called as father of modern organic agriculture, worked at Pusa Bangal. That time, this Bihar and Bengal were undivided, or you can call undivided Bengal. Documented traditional Indian farming practices and came to regard them as superior to conventional agriculture. What were conventional practices? Your crop rotations, legumes, and your uh, even fellow, fellow, fellow uh, lands or keeping the lands fellow was also a technique or practice, a uh, practice by our farmers. Now he wrote uh, two books. And one was an agricultural testament in 1943, and in 1947 he wrote the book, The Soil and Health. A study of organic agriculture. So it was that it was first time that organic agriculture came in the title of any book. And you can see these books, uh, the soil health, a study of organic agriculture. And one more is there, an agricultural testament. The picture is not available, but uh, you can easily download this book. Oh, it is there on the left side. You can see an agricultural testament by Sir Albert Howard and also on the right side. These two books are important. And the book on the left side, it may be of 100 pages or 110 pages. It is worth reading. Whenever you find time in your life, you read this book and your fundamentals, the, the basic things about soil fertility or soil health will, be, will become very, very clear if you read this book. It is not uh, written on... Uh, on scientific basis, this is fully on, based upon scientific principles. The things which were written in this book are true even today, are correct even today. Agriculture Research Station, and then he shifted to Indore, and the Maharaja of Indore gave him some land on his request, and he developed Indore Aerobic Composting Technique there. Indore Aerobic Composting Technique means process of composting which is now called as indoor process. Uh, North American as well as British organic farming was fundamentally influenced by Hobart. So what he did, he shared his experience, experiences from the East in the West. So he took these ideas from India to USA through Rodale and to UK also. So by reintegrating the different agricultural research disciplines, he concluded that health of soil Plants, animals, and humans are interrelated, as as we find that these are. This is very true statement. A humus rich soil is the key to success. Successful organic farm means your soil should have sufficient levels of organic matter. Almost same time, there was one more British Britisher in India. He was colonel or major in army. Army also have some doctors, so he was basically a doctor, but he got some some uh, um, some name or some post also in army. Uh, the, he established the Institute of Nutrition in 1918, originally a single room lab at the Pasture Institute, Kunnur, Tamil Nadu. So in Kunnur is a place in Tamil Nadu where uh, he established one small lab having just one room for his study of beriberi and was called the beriberi inquiry unit. What happened in those days, people were traveling through the ships and it took many months to go from one place to another place. And during those journeys, people suffered from some vitamin deficiencies or some diseases. Beriberi may be one of them. So he, he made some studies on beriberi. The facility moved to Hyderabad in 1958. And in 1969, it was renamed as National Institute of Nutrition. This institute is uh, coming under Government of India institution, which is mainly analyzing the uh, Indian food items, doing analysis how rich Indian foods are there in the nutri nutrients. And Robert McCarrison, a nutrition research lab in Kunnur, he established the relationship among soil fertility, food quality, and human nutrition, like your uh, Albert Hover. Mac Carrison, he, he found that decreased food quality due to increased use of mineral nitrogen fertilizer. He studied the health and physics of, physics of the Hunja people. Hunja people are very, very important. They have been part of the history of organic agriculture in the world. 
and and he also made his studies on indian diets indian diets from say sikh diet pathan diet or maratha diet or there may be nepali diet and european diet means the composition of food will vary what a sikh diet means punjab diet and, and maybe pathan diet or maratha diet so variety of diets he has taken where variety of food items were there some were rich in meat some were not rich in meat so he made his studies on the reds and he found that the sikh diet sikh diet was the best one and it consisted of whole wheat wheat flour chapatis butter whole milk dal fresh raw vegetables uh, libeta li, libeta add libeta means uh, you can eat as much as much as you like and fresh meat with bone once a week so this was considered as the as the best diet so he said how this diets or how your food is related to your health so he did such kind of experiment on rats actually you cannot do on human beings so he made some conclusions some interesting conclusions that your diet your food affects your health and regarding hunja tribes uh, jai rodel studied hunja tribe he wrote a book on them uh, they are basically indigenous to hunja valley and where is this hunja valley like kashmir valley it is in kara kaur kora mountains so once your himalayas are over after that you go to ranges of kara kora passing through pakistan uh, and the region is called as gilgit baltistan a region of pakistan so in this gilgit baltistan region of pakistan you go to one valley which is hunja valley and the river is also hunja valley is also hunja a name of the people is also hunja you can see the location in this map it is uh, beyond uh, it is above the jammu and kashmir ladakh you can see this part is your gilgit baltistan region and in this you got hunja valley and it is considered as even more beautiful than our kashmir valley hunja valley uh, healthy living advocate jai rodel the healthy hunjas in 1955 a book was written by rodel the healthy hunjas so hunjas are actually known for their longevity they live on an average more than 100 years what are the reasons for their long age is because they eat organic food healthy organic food and plenty of fresh air say 10 20 or 30 years before they did not have uh, machines also tractors were not there so pollution was not there they have got hunja river which gives them fresh water clean water and they get uh, variety of dry fruits also so their health is good they eat organic they look like this these people hunja people <clears throat> and they do not have any case of cancer also because they consume approximately 200 times more vitamin b17 than the average american because the kind of fruits they eat dry fruits kobani or maybe your uh, apricot uh, uh, you got uh, almonds or some other kind of dry fruits are there so which improve their health so this is in brief about the history in india now in the modern india history of modern india means after green revolution what has been done by government of india so most importantly launching of national program of organic production npop on 8th may 2000 so what was the purpose of national program of organic production the basic purpose was to promote protect and develop the indian organic movement and install accreditation and certification process means in involve the regulation process of organic products regulate the products means develop standards and uh, uh, arrange the process of certification and then other job was the accreditation and certification program was implemented on 1st october 2001 so this was also government responsibility and then the third uh, job done by government of india is organic logo released by government of india on 26 july 2002 now see this national program of organic production 
is being implemented by Ministry of Commerce through NPOP, through APIDA. This NPOP is implemented by Ministry of Commerce through APIDA. So this APIDA is part of Ministry of Commerce. And the job is to develop standards and arrange or help in the certification process and also accreditation of certification agencies. So you can see so far this government of India has developed national standards in 2005, modified in 2014 or updated in 2014. And they have also developed uh, accreditation criteria for accrediting inspection and certification agencies. Some criteria have been developed to authorize uh, private agencies to start or to do certification. Now you see government schemes are also there for uh, promotion of organic farming. You can see National Project of Organic on Organic Farming. National Project of on Organic Farming is basically implemented by uh, National Institute of uh, Organic and Natural Farming, Gaziabad, with its uh, centers or with its regional stations in the country. This National Project on Organic Farming is implemented by National Institute of Organic and Natural Farming, Gaziabad. And under this project, they are promoting organic farming, they are promoting biofertilizer, helping in uh, producing biofertilizer, etc. And NHM, National Horticulture Mission, is also support, supporting uh, organic farming indirectly. Horticulture Mission for Northeast and Himalayan States, HMNEH, also supporting organic farming. National Project on Management of Soil health and I'm coming back, I'm coming back, there is some problem. Can you see the presentation? Yes, Hello? sir. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, National Project on Management of Soil Health and Fertility, you know this, uh, this is big project in the country, Network Project on Organic Farming, this is by ICR, uh, Indian Institute of Farming System Research, Modipuram, Merit, and then PKVY. What is full form of PKVY? Paramparagat Kushi Vikas Yojana. Okay, so according to government, this Paramparagat Kirshi is your organic Kirshi or organic farm. So in this, a, what is PKVY? A subcomponent of soil health management scheme under National Mission of Sustainable Agriculture. Its aim is to develop a sustainable models, sustainable models of organic farming through a mix of traditional wisdom and modern science. Means combine both traditional wisdom as well as modern science to develop organic farming in the country. Aims to empower farmers through institutional development through cluster approach. So cluster approach is your certain number of farmers can come together say 50 acre land can be pooled by farmers and then they will get subsidy on organic production, which is about rupees 50,000 per hectare for three years. So that is the main advantage that farmers will get some subsidy, some incentive of money under this scheme. So you can see uh, about 20,000 rupees per acre are given to the farmers. The natural farming, it is quite controversial and I do not want uh, it to discuss much uh, this natural farming, but definitely uh, sometimes you cannot speak the truth, dear students. Your your lips are locked. You cannot 
say much because you cannot go against the people, against the general views and so on. Same is happening with nano urea also. Uh, you, you are, uh, means uh, you are tight lipped, means you cannot see, open your mouth. Same is happening with natural farming also. The government is, however, promoting natural farming through Bhartiya Prakritik Krishi Padati, BPKP, introduced during 2021 as a sub scheme of Paramparagat Krishi Vikas Yojana for the promotion of traditional and indigenous practices, including natural farming. So a lot of confusion is existing in, in our country now. You see, area under organic farming on an average was 3.5 to 4 million hectares, out of which uh, on an average 2 to 2.5 million hectares was under cultivated, cultivated organic farming. But now, in 22-23, this area has jumped to about more than 5 million hectares under organic farming. You know, net cultivated area in India is now around 140 million hectares. Out of 140 million hectares, now as per government, more than 5 million hectare area is under organic farming. So what happened? Certain states have given some data on natural farming and also area under conversion of organic farming. So those areas have been added to the net cultivated area. That is why some area has been overestimated. So these kind of unscientific things are really, uh, these misleading things are really coming and uh, we do not have courage to say them wrong. Anyway, let us see what happens, but uh, maybe it depends upon farmer. If your technology, if your practice is good, it will be adopted by them. Otherwise it will not be adopted. Even if you as a student, if you go out, go to a market to buy a pen of a particular company. If it works well, well, if it satisfies you, you will buy it again. If that does not satisfy you, if it does not work well, you will not buy it. That particular pen, you will buy another pen. Same is applicable to uh, real life also, in agriculture also. If your product is not good, farmer will not use it. If a variety is, loose, is susceptible to insect pests and disease, Farmers will not grow it, but farmers can grow even local variety if it is tolerant to insect pests and disease, if it is giving them better return. So similarly, natural farming also, today or tomorrow, I think as even as on today, there may be very few farmers who must be practicing natural farming. This is a wrong use of word natural farming here. It cannot be natural farming. It cannot be called natural farming. So anyway, just you see the government is also implementing dedicated organic farming schemes. Paramparagat Kishi Vikas Yojana means they have inserted natural farming everywhere. Wherever you have organic farming there, this natural farming has been inserted. Now coming to modern organic farming or organic agriculture, the Sikkim is fully organic state declared on 18 January 2016. And area is though, though it is a small 75,000 hectare, but it is fully organic state. Other governments are also trying to become uh, organic. Other states are, many states are on the very close to organic farming. Soon you will find that one or two states have also declared themselves as organic state. Number of organic um, educational opportunities are coming up in organic farming. Even our ICR endorses the MSc degree on organic farming. You might be knowing it. One university or two universities in India have started giving degrees in MSc, agro, MSc organic farming. So, but, but there is some problem in the PhD. It is only for MSc in organic farming. PhD is not yet started. ICR has constituted a committee for developing syllabus and curricula of natural farming at UG and postgraduate level. So this can be very disastrous and confusing also. We have already have syllabus of organic farming. Now we, we will have syllabus for natural farming also. So I do not know what this committee has done, but there are their hands are also tied. They have to give syllabus for natural farming, whether it will work or not. 
there is no harm in doing organic farming. It will serve our purpose. Why to go for natural farming? But as a student, I remind you that you have to is, is speak positively about natural farming in any interview or in any uh, fora. Whenever you are there, you should not criticize natural farming because many times our our um, we have limitations. Of course, we have free speech, but with limitations. So you you can use those limitations and uh, you can speak. Natural farming is good. It is going to solve problem this and that. But when you, whenever you go to real situation, do not mislead the farmers. Tell them honestly that you test, you do on a small area. If you feel okay, then you do at a bigger area. But do not start with bigger area. Do it in, say, one-fourth of uh, acre, something like that. So uh, it's not everything can be told here. But whenever you meet me personally, I can explain you the matter of the facts about these kind of things. See, uh, you are just sitting near a field and you are doing bhajan. You are singing songs. Will it increase your crop yield? Astika. You are sitting, you are doing havan. You are sitting near a field. You are doing havan. You are uh, taking a horn of uh, cattle and and putting some uh, silica into it, and then that putting the that horn near the field, will it increase your yield? No, sir. <laughs> yeah, that, that is the problem. So same is happening in these kind of farming where people are unnecessarily, uh, unnecessarily means putting religion into them. That should not be the case actually. So even uh, uh, now the people. Um, even the younger students are being uh, asked to learn organic farming from class 6 to 8. We got one book from NCRT on organic farming. Uh, ICR, IRE, uh, we were supposed to start a diploma course in organic farming since July 22. But it did not happen, although the homework has been done, but maybe... Uh, in 23 or 20, 23 is also over. Maybe in 24, IR can start, I don't know. But IR is thinking like this. But IGNU, several state agriculture universities, HPKV Palampur giving MSc, MIT University giving MSc, and in several places you will find uh, IGNU is giving PG diploma in organic farming. And even surprisingly, long back in 2017, Punjab Agricultural University also established a new school of organic farm. Otherwise, Punjab Agricultural University was good promoter of conventional farming or chemical farming, fertilizer farming. Training opportunities are there in IFOM. Several agencies uh, are involved in this. In different countries, you have agencies. In India, you have APIDA, Agricultural and Processed Food Products Export Development Authority. Please try to learn or remember full form of APIDA, Agricultural and Processed Food Products Export Development. Now, participatory guarantee system, I will take this subject in detail. So, government have, have also uh, found some logo for P, uh, this PGS certification, this blue and red one. I will explain you later. One, If one is interested to know more and more, you can go to this website, apida.gov.in. So you'll find information about what is TraceNet, the details, and this is how it looks. In APITA, you go to first page and go to organic products. Then click this, you'll find all information related to organic farming in India. This is all official information. If you want data in India for several years on organic production, state-wise, plant-wise, crop-wise, all kind of data is available. Name of exporter, importers you can find. So all sorts of, you can see the standards. If you want to see these standards are written documents. These are PDF files where certain rules are written and certain certificates for them. So everything you can find here. And also the, uh, the other relevant information you can get from National Center of Organic Farming. It was established in 2004. So a lot of information, production technology and so on is available on this. And in 2022, just one year back, it was named as National Center for 
organic and natural farm. This is not required actually. I don't know why it is required. Anyway, you can see this National Center of Organic and Natural Farming. It has got about nine centers. Nine centers in Bangalore, Bhubaneswar, Gandhinagar, Gaziabad, Imphal, Jabalpur, Nagpur, Panchkula, Patna. So actually in Gaziabad, you have two kinds of center. One is the national center. And one is also a regional center within this. Regional center to, to take care of Uttar Pradesh, Delhi, Uttarakhand, and Rajasthan. So do not get confused. In Gaziabad also, you have one regional center. And it is, of course, the national center also located in Gaziabad. So thank you very much. And Vandana Shiva has been very, very uh, strong in promoting this uh, organic farming in the country. And she has written Wealth Per Acre and Health Per Acre. Two very interesting books were written by her. So now your questions are welcome. Uh, you, you can open your videos and uh, I can finish, finish this class. So friends, your questions are welcome. Whatever I, I could cover in brief, this, this was history of organic farming. And uh, if you have any question, you can ask. Yeah, Hachappa. Any question you have in your mind? Hello. Yes. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, sir, a general question. Hai. Uh, as a, um, a scope of career ke aspect, mein dekhe, to, sir, organic farming, mein, farming ka kya, um, aage chal ke scope of farming? See, scope. Uh, see, it depends if you're talking about employment. Yes, sir. Number of things. One is employment. One is scope is in employment. So, like any other degree, like any other degree, you will get a degree and you have to appear in other competitive examinations. That is true. But if you want to gain experience in organic farming and want to develop your own industry or your own business or your own things, then there is some scope. For example, you have a scope. It's, there are two things. One is input, other is output. Inputs are your biofertilizer, inputs are your pesticides, and inputs may be your manures, your vermicompost, compost. So production of and processing of inputs is also important. One can establish uh, uh, these are uh, herbs or pesticides like the botanical pesticides. I can make new products. I can make uh, all the products, variety of products can be made to control insect pests and disease, and that can be sold. So many startups have come in this area. A lot of startups I have seen in this area. And similarly, vermicompost, compost, even seed industry. There is zero seed production, zero organic seed production. Organic seeds are not available. That is the biggest limitation. So it depends how efficiently one can market. Marketing of input as well as marketing of output is always important in any kind of agriculture. Uh, some people can simply send, you, you see this, what is nano urea? Just 20 gram, I think, nitrogen in one bottle. And you can imagine they are getting 210 rupees. I remember in Haridwar, one Pani bottle, he said that it cures cancer. Some years back, you may be too young. That was sold for 100 rupees, 200 rupees, one bottle. So it depends how intelligently you can market your product, whether it is input, whether it is output. In output also, you can have uh, produce yourself, you can sell it, you can process it, you can export it. There are a lot many opportunities are there. I will definitely discuss when, it, when I will teach you scope of organic farm. Any other question? Yes. So thank you very much. See you soon. I will inform you about the next class. You have anything more to say? Anything more to say? Thank you very much.